Good afternoon and welcome to the AFT's 2021 Virtual Teach Conference. I'm Ellen Bernstein and I'm the proud president of the Albuquerque Teachers Federation in New Mexico. I also have the honor of chairing the AFT Teachers Program and Policy Council. On behalf of all the Albuquerque educators and AFT members, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone virtually to AFT Teach. It's been a year like no other. We have faced a worldwide pandemic. Here in our country, we've been dealing with multiple crises, economic fallout and inequity from COVID-19, racial injustice, the climate crisis, and real severe threats to our democracy. And yet, Members everywhere have stepped up and every role group represented by the AFT have demonstrated tremendous resilience and tenacity as each of us has stepped up for our students, our colleagues, and our communities more over the past 16 months than ever before. So like many people around our nation and around the world, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a terrible toll on us but many people have paid the ultimate sacrifice, including many in our AFT family. Please join me in a moment of silence and remember our fellow AFT members who were lost this year. Thank you. I'm joining you today from my birthplace, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Let me tell you a little bit about New Mexico. New Mexico is the sixth most diverse state in our country. We're ranked number two for linguistic diversity, number four for household type diversity, and number six for marital status diversity. I join you from the traditional land of the Pueblo peoples. There are 19 Pueblo tribes in New Mexico and each Pueblo is a sovereign nation. It is with honor and gratitude that I acknowledge the land and the native people who have throughout the generations been stewards of our environment. Pueblo people have preserved their identity in the face of multiple colonizing nations. And today, as always, value their identity and traditional ways of life, maintaining connection to ancestors and to the earth. I mention this because all of us must commit to continuing to learn more as we each can become better stewards of the land that we inhabit. Thank you again. Even though we're not sitting next to each other in plenary sessions and workshops or connecting in person with fellow members from across the country, virtual teach is still a great opportunity for all of us to expand our knowledge, deepen our practice, and find solutions to problems. I believe one of the most important things we can do as unionists is to engage each other in thought-provoking conversations about the work that we do. That's AFT Teach, Together Educating America's Children. 
you can participate in one of the 60 workshops that will earn you professional development credits and catch up with friends via the workshop Zoom chat boxes. Tune in to hear amazing speech speeches such as Professor Ibram Kendi on anti-racist teaching strategies and Stacey Abrams on saving our democracy. Check out all the TEACH speakers yoga and physical health sessions, movie nights, and much more at the AFT Teach Attendee Hub. Also, you can watch the plenary sessions live streamed on the AFT Facebook page or on the AFT YouTube channel. Just a few housekeeping items to keep in mind. Check out the Virtual Expo and our online exhibitors for a variety of resources and tools to take back home and use in your classrooms and schools. You can hear more about AFT programs and partners by visiting virtual booths, meeting with staff via appointments, or participating in virtual meetings during dedicated hours at the Attendee Hub. Visit the Game tab in the Attendee Hub to find out how you can earn points by attending sessions and completing tasks, like taking action in the AFT Action Center, meeting the exhibitors and submitting feedback. The top scorers will receive prizes. And last but not least, get engaged on social media while attending. Please post pictures of your teach experiences using hashtag teach21. As I said in the beginning, this has been a year like no other. Thank you for all you've done to support students, their families, yourselves, and our communities. As you have been there to support others, our union, the AFT, has been there for all of us. I'd like to turn your attention to this video highlighting how the AFT has been supporting all of us to help ensure that we have the freedom to thrive, to recover, reopen, and reimagine public education. It is an international pandemic. We do need to close our schools for the coming days. Extend the closure of all public schools in Maryland. Of all schools in the state of South Carolina. Coastal Ridge Elementary School switched to distance learning. What will this mean for your kids? Our school district now says it's getting ready to offer online education. We are, in a matter of days, fundamentally changing everything about education. And so what teachers are doing all across the nation is trying to help engage kids in the way in which we can, meeting their needs. Whether you've been a teacher for one year or 40 years, you've never seen anything quite like this. Transform my living room table into a workspace. And this is where school happens. A happy first day of VLA. I miss each and every last one of you. I know things may be a little confusing right now and a little scary. Let us know what's going on. We want to hear from you. We really do. We miss you. It sounds cliche, but it is about love, loving your students and showing them that you care, showing up every single day. It's very difficult to be a teacher right now. I don't want to be a statistic. This year has been very tough for every teacher, I believe. People are grieving because of who they lost. I'm exhausted beyond measure. Teachers all across America have been working harder than I've ever seen before. They don't train you for extended distance learning, right? I would say almost none of my students had technology. And if they have internet connection, they don't have a computer. It is clearly the digital divide. You have the have and the have not. The biggest thing I had to do was learn the technology. What you're seeing in the country is a patchwork failure. When you have hybrid, you're, you're really teaching two classes at a time. Frankly, hybrid really... It stinks. It stinks. <laughs> it stinks. I see teachers all the time calling their students up, calling their parents up. We all want to be out of this. No one wants to be in school more than teachers. I've spent more time engaging with parents around the anxiety. And I said, guess what? Every morning you wake up, you made it, you survived. We're survivors.
you know what, you can't just sit back. If you feel like it's wrong, there are things you can do about it. That's what we do when we teach. You gotta meet fear with facts. See, we're not talking about equality, we're talking about equity. I really want to see real change. This is not acceptable. Our kids are not expendable. Our educators are not expendable. We would love to be in our classrooms, but to put a fan inside of the window as if that's going to keep us from contracting any virus. 48 degrees with those children in that classroom is a no-go. This is the actual fan. No justice! No justice! No justice! Because I gotta let you know that black liberation it's for the liberation of everybody. Marsha is just a superhero without a cape. She is one of those people who will go down in history. My colleagues were teachers came and stood up for me. This is our work. This is the work of the AFT. This takeover is an abject failure. Can no longer just let things go. We have to speak up and stand up for our children and our families. We want to make sure and see that the HEROES Act passed. We need to be able to safely reopen these schools. And the only thing they ask of our government is to get them some PPE. Why did it have to be the union that did it? I'm glad we did, but this is employer responsibility. This means so much to us. We have a president who is trying to legislate Tweet. The idea of saying, go do it on your own, that doesn't work. The Fox News decision desk can now project former Vice President Joe Biden to become the 46th president of the United States. For American educators, this is a great day for y'all. bringing 15,000 books. Este actividad es de gran significado para los estudiantes y maestros. I truly believe in Share My Lesson and I think it, it is a huge asset for our teachers. We have books for you. We've always appreciated teachers, but now I think we do more than ever. Yes. What about this? It gives us a sense that we're, you know, we're all in this together. We're really teaching. This is the 10th school visit I have made in the last month. Hi, can we come in? We see that all these safety things were the way back into school, where we see our friends. That's where teachers can read cues. Wow, what's going on? Build relationships. I see the light in the eyes. Thank you for interrupting our reading. Well, how can we come back to school five days a week, but how do we make it safe? We want them to be here. Get to be with your friends again. That's really cool, right? I could not have opened the building without my union partnership. Really uh, appreciate you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> could not have done what we've done without it being a collaborative effort. They're like, oh, we're so happy to be back. I just want to spend time with my friends. We feel that the kids are safe, the drivers are safe. I think my takeaway is that we relied on each other. With mitigation and with vaccines, we're going to have as close to a normal school year as possible. We love it. Go straight in, sweetie pie. And it's not just being in school, but we have to recover and reimagine public education. What kind of resources are, going to be, are we going to wrap around schools? Let's make sure we do civics, we do social studies, we do science, and we spark kids' passion. So thank you to all of those who were in the video, and thank you to our amazing videotographers who have really tried to capture this year. And thank you, Ellen, for your leadership of the PPC and thank you for honoring those we have loved and lost. And for everybody else, welcome to TEACH. 
How I wish we were together in the same room, not the same Zoom. But like virtually everything else these last 16 months, we figured out how to overcome obstacles and uncertainty. We MacGyvered it, like you have been doing every single day since March 2020. How many times this past school year did you think, I just can't keep doing this? Yet you did. Like David Finkel. There he is, a ninth grade English teacher in the land, Florida, who taught in person and remote simultaneously. David was stuck at his computer in the corner of his classroom so students learning remotely could see him on the computer's camera, making him wish there were two of him. And as I talk about Florida, before I get to Roz, as I talk about Florida, I just want to say our hearts, our prayers, our thoughts go with everyone who is in the eye of Elsa right now. Please be safe. And then there's Rosamond Looney, a first grade teacher in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, who is her school's teacher of the year. And yet Roz feels like, this is her words, not mine, a mediocre version of my teaching self. And I hope, Rosamond, you are watching because I know your students and their families are so grateful to you. And then there's Maxie Hollingsworth, an elementary school math specialist in Houston who rotated from classroom to classroom working with children and then meticulously sanitized desks, pencils, and math manipulatives as she lived with the constant fear that she would bring the coronavirus home to her daughter who has asthma. At what point last year did you feel end of the year tired? Was it winter break? Halloween? <laughs> Maybe it was Labor Day. But you dug deep and you got your students through it. I love how a student summed it up at a moving up ceremony on Long Island last week. We did it. You did. You did it in so many incredible ways. Kyle Stern, a math teacher in West Suburban, Illinois, wrote to every student while they were learning remotely, reminding his students that teachers are there for them, even when they're not in person. And then there was Jane Judson, an art teacher. That's one of her, art, one of her pieces of art, or one of her kids' pieces of artwork here. She's an art teacher at Humanities and Arts High School in Queens. And she had students list words they associated with their isolation during the pandemic, and then create an image to express one of those words. Several of her students won awards for their artwork. And then there's Kate Sundin. She teaches chemistry in Philadelphia and coaches a speech and debate team. Kate and her students were trying to enter a national debate competition, but many students had glitchy or no internet connection. So it took Kate three weeks to piece together their online submission, and she hit send one minute before the midnight deadline. Don't worry, I could, but I am not going through our 1.7 million members and all of their stories. But you get what my point is. Educators have been first responders to students' needs, their technological, their academic, and their emotional needs. At, at a recent roundtable in the Bronx, high school students talked about how their teachers have been a lifeline during this difficult time. That's been so important. But it's also what Harry Potter calls a heroic responsibility. And heroic responsibilities can take their toll. The RAND Corporation worked with the AFT and the NEA to survey public school teachers. 78% of teachers reported experiencing frequent job-related stress, almost twice as many as most other working adults during the pandemic. 
and teachers were almost three times as likely to experience symptoms of depression as the general adult population. Teachers cited the stress of simultaneous teaching and the difficulty of maintaining contact with students and families, supporting our students' social emotional health and keeping them engaged, as well as teachers' concerns about their own or their loved one's health. Sound familiar? It's crucial for the people who take care of others to take care of themselves. That's why the AFT introduced a free trauma counseling benefit for our members. You can find it on the website. And this TEACH conference, we devote a whole strand to educator well-being with sessions on self-compassion and social-emotional learning and other routines. And don't forget, share my lesson. It's available 24-7, and it's free. It's our award-winning platform for education resources, which has evolved to meet teachers' needs during this pandemic. And by the way, parents' needs and communities' needs. There are countless other ways the AFT is there for you. Take student debt. We are fighting to cancel $50,000 of student debt and to fix public service loan forgiveness, PSLF. And then in the short run, keep the moratorium on student debt payments, which expires in September. We're also fighting back against predatory student loan servicers. And the AFT's member benefit called Summer helps borrowers get into student debt plans that can save them money, saving some members hundreds of dollars a month. Again, you can find this on our website. We have fought and keep fighting for the resources and the safe and welcoming school environments you and your students deserve. And President Biden's American Rescue Plan has hugely helped in this regard. And this year, we're also expanding our collective bargaining work because, as President Biden said this week, educators deserve a raise, not just praise. And by the way, the First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, is joining us tomorrow at a school we will visit together in Washington, D.C. Educators have just been through the second most challenging year of your professional lives. What, you may ask, will be the most challenging year? That's the one that starts this fall. Your students will return with enormous needs, and there still won't be enough school counselors, psychologists, or nurses. And far too many schools still need ventilation system overhauls and other infrastructure improvements. And while there's not enough political will to lower class size, there will be enormous pressure to make up for lost time. We must find ways to support each other, teachers supporting teachers, unions and school officials supporting school staff, and all of us supporting students and families. It won't be easy, and some people will try to make it harder, like those who have disparaged educators, scapegoated our unions, and blamed us for things outside our control, like school closures caused by a global pandemic. On Fox and Friends, Pete Hegseth mocked our safety concerns, saying that we're rigging it so teachers don't have to go to work as if teaching remotely isn't and wasn't incredibly hard work. OK, I've been the target of a lot of these right-wing disinformation campaigns. But it comes with the territory. And I've been tweeted at by parents who are angry and frustrated by the effects of the pandemic on their children. I reached out to some of these parents. Their frustration and fear are real. Both those who wanted schools open in person all this year, as well as parents 
who are still worried whether their kids will be safe in school next year. It's the attacks from the Trump and DeVos crowd that really offend me. They failed to develop a coherent strategy to help people through the pandemic, yet they attacked us as if we were trying to create the safe conditions and the trust that was needed to reopen schools. Let's set the record straight. The AFT put out our plan to safely reopen schools in April 2020, a month after the first school closures. By the way, that plan is still on our website. We developed our plan with health and education experts and with input from our members. And as we learn more about COVID, our plan evolved with the science. Even before COVID, we knew that kids learn best in person and that remote, hybrid, and simultaneous instruction are not adequate substitutes. Our public schools are centers of community. It's not just where kids learn academics, it's where they build relationships. Many children who otherwise might go hungry eat breakfast and lunch at school, and parents rely on schools not only to educate their kids, but so they can work. Unions have always worked to keep our members and those we serve safe, whether it's in a school, a hospital, or a meat packing plant. It's not an either or, in-person teaching and learning or keeping people safe, it's a both and. Creating safe conditions in schools during a public health crisis is not an obstacle to reopening classrooms. It's the pathway to going back, staying back, and creating trust throughout the school community. Our members told us that repeatedly over the past 16 months. You knew how important it is for kids to be in school, and you wanted to be back in your classrooms with the right safety measures. That's what 76% of our education members said in June 2020, and what 80% of you told us this February 2021. And now, with nine out of 10 AFT members being vaccinated or having been vaccinated, we can be even more confident about returning to school in person this fall. The vaccines, they've been game changers. And the more that people were back in school with few outbreaks, the more that staff, students, and parents trusted we could be fully back in school safely. I've seen that for myself. Since March, once I was fully vaccinated, I've visited our members throughout the United States, nurses and healthcare professionals who are on the front line of the pandemic in Alaska, Oregon, and Washington. And I've been in many schools that successfully reopened for in-person learning with safeguards in place, from a bus depot in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, to a school powered by solar energy on Staten Island. I saw the joy, the excitement, and the relief that students and staff have felt over being back. Schools can reopen this fall in person, five days a week, with mitigation measures, ventilation upgrades, and social, emotional, and academic supports for students. Yes, of course that requires resources. And that's why every day since the start of the pandemic, the AFT has fought in Washington for federal funding for schools. And we fought for the COVID relief packages for families, for healthcare providers, to keep state and local governments and small businesses afloat, and to keep educators and other public employees from keep, from, or to keep them from losing their jobs, which 900,000 did initially. So I wanna thank you, all of you who participated or are participating in our virtual lobby day today. I can't wait till we're back in person instead of virtually. <laughs>
It's been a tale of two administrations. While Donald Trump tweeted at schools to reopen, remember this? He either wasn't interested in or up to fighting the virus. We were working to reopen schools in a climate of chaos, fear, and misinformation. Thankfully, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris changed course. The Biden administration has fought the pandemic with science, truth, transparency, and yes, money through the American Rescue Plan. There's been bumps, of course. This is a once in a century pandemic. But look at what has happened. By the end of this school year, nearly all K-12 schools were open for in-person teaching and learning. And virtually every school system is planning for full reopening this fall, and many are offering summer programs for academic recovery and for fun. Yes, there are still risks. The Delta variant is causing alarming increases in infections in the parts of the United States and the world with low vaccination rates. It's more transmissible than the other COVID variants, and it's putting unvaccinated people at greater risk of infection, including kids who are too young to receive the vaccine. That's why the World Health Organization has once again recommended masks. We need the scientists' help. And as the science and circumstances have evolved, the AFT has sought updated guidance from the CDC. We asked in a letter that we sent them in May, will layered mitigation strategies in schools continue to include three feet physical distancing, surveillance testing, occupancy limits, and adequate ventilation? Will the guidance continue to require mask wearing in school setting for children under 12? Will the CDC recommend protocols for masking so teachers are not called out or called on to be the mask police? We need this science-grounded guidance to clear up ambiguities and reflect the realities of school environments. COVID relief funds, They've been life-changing. Ask any parent who has received the child tax credit. And the funds have helped schools big time. Last month, I visited Martin Luther King Jr. campus in New York City with United Federation of Teachers President Michael Mulgrew. Now, I spent a lot of my life at the UFT. And throughout my years at the UFT, we fought unsuccessfully to get the ventilation systems at MLK fixed. Now, with funding from the CARES Act and help from outside experts that the UFT brought in, the city fixed it. And students and staff at MLK can finally breathe healthy air. And as an asthmatic, I always carry my inhaler with me. As an asthmatic, I felt it immediately. Thank you, Michael for your efforts. The people closest to our public schools know what they need, and they must have a say in how these funds are used. In Philadelphia, our Philadelphia Federation of Teacher members testified before the city council recently about priorities for allocating rescue plan funding, emphasizing investments in facilities, mental health support, and supplies. And last week, way across the state in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Public Schools announced a stakeholder advisory committee that will help the district decide how to spend about $100 million in federal COVID relief funds. And that committee includes parents, reps from the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers, reps from the Administrators Association, and other stakeholder groups, obviously. These examples show it's possible to create safe and welcoming environments in schools this fall. Yet some families still have reservations. People whose loved ones have gotten sick or died from COVID may have heightened fears about sending their children to school. Families may be skeptical that the safety precautions will be in place. Think about it. 
If the bathrooms at their child school lack soap before the pandemic or the ventilation was poor, it's still a concern now until you see that it's changed. Children may be too young or unable to be vaccinated. And we know that many parents are uncertain about the efficaciousness or the safety of the vaccines. Others think they have to pay for the vaccine, even though it is free, or they lack transportation to vaccination sites, or they can't miss work. Some concerns have nothing to do with COVID. Parents whose children have been bullied, whose children have experienced racism or anti-Semitism or anti-Asian bigotry, or whose kids have not been well served academically, they may see remote learning as a refuge. These are all barriers we have to overcome to ensure a safe and welcoming back to school for all. And that's exactly what the AFT and memory, many members like you are working to do. Back to school time is always a time of hope, excitement, and a little trepidation. <laughs> and it will be even more so this year. Every year, from local unions to yours truly, the AFT does a back to school campaign. And this year, the AFT is ramping up these efforts, dedicating $5 million to a back to school for all campaign, with members reaching out to families and communities about being back. Thus far, the AFT has made 40 grants. This is since the middle of May. We've made 40 grants to state and local unions, totaling more than $2.5 million, covering about 1,400 AFT locals in 22 states, and more grant requests are rolling in. We know that first and foremost, we must work together to make schools safe and welcoming. Safe from toxic air, safe from mold, safe from contaminants like lead and asbestos, safe from the spread of COVID, safe from discrimination, bigotry, bullying, and violence, and safe for every child to feel that they are welcome for who they are. The same should be true for their families and for school staff. Every school should be a place where parents want to send their children, where educators want to work, and where our kids thrive. Starting next week, AFT will operate office hours in clinics, designated times when affiliates and others can call in to discuss ideas and get technological and technical support. And share my lesson will be a clearinghouse for best practices. But the most meaningful part of this campaign is the ways that members, staff, and volunteers are connecting with families to rebuild relationships and rebuild trust all grounded in our shared goal of helping all our children thrive. There are several statewide back to school for all campaigns already in California, in Massachusetts, in New Jersey, and New York. And members in AFT locals, both big and small, are getting involved. In Wilmar, Minnesota, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Pittsburgh, members are going door to door, visiting students' homes to talk about the health and safety and education programs in place and to encourage families to send their kids back for in-person learning. In New York City, the UFT is reaching out to families through the UFT parent liaisons, partnerships with community and religious organizations, and through advertising to build families' trust and confidence about their children returning to school. And thanks to educators' advocacy, the New York City budget just passed at the end of June will enable schools to hire more teachers, including music and art professionals, and academic interventionists, more social workers, more psychologists, and other mental health professionals, and will expand community schools. The Chicago Teachers Union Summer Organizing Campaign is centered on increasing vaccination rates, promoting SEL, and lobbying for more American Rescue Plan money to be devoted to communities highly impacted by the pandemic. Education Austin's family engagement plans include having 1,500 
one-on-one -on -one family conversations to gather feedback on challenges and ensure a safe return to school. Members of the Cleveland Teachers Union are con contacting families of students who had limited or no attendance last school year. They're phone banking and knocking on doors. They're distributing first book materials at community events, and they're working with the district to make sure kids and families have what they need to return to school full time in the fall. Same in Martinsville, Indiana, where the union is working with the district to reach out to families of the 800 students who were lost during the pandemic. I think you're getting my drift here. In Houston, a 12-member community canvassing team will target the city's poorest zip codes where student absences have been the highest. The Houston Federation of Teachers and the Houston Education Support Personnel aim not only to encourage families to return to the neighborhood public schools, but to join the fight for community schools and against school privatization. And then, in Massachusetts, AFT locals in Chelsea, Lawrence, Lynn, Springfield, Boston, Lowell, and New Medford will offer outdoor back-to-school fairs with snacks, with books from our partnership with First Book, and will have mobile vaccina vaccination clinics. They'll also go door to door to let the community know that schools are safe and ready for students to return this fall. With every door knock and every conversation, we're trying not only to bring students back to school, but to heal the fractures in our communities. And I've been involved in a lot of campaigns over a lot of years. I have never seen an effort to connect schools with families and communities on this scale. Our members rock. So if you're interested and you haven't yet gotten involved, but you want to be involved in this campaign, go to aft.org slash, slash, excuse me, renaissance. We know it's not just about returning to school. We need the supports to help students recover, socially, emotionally, academically. And it's also a time, as I said in May, to reimagine teaching and learning, to focus on what sparks students' passion, what nurtures critical thinking, and what brings learning to life. There was an epidemic of anxiety and depression among young people even before the stress and isolation caused by COVID. And many more students will return to school this year with even greater needs. Our affiliates know this, and they've been fighting for long-term commitments to get more of the nurses, counselors, psychologists, speech and language, and other professionals we know our students need. And I'm grateful to President Biden for securing the funding to do this. But some school officials say they won't invest in these essential personnel, not because kids don't need them, they do, but because the funding could go away. It's time to stop being penny wise and pound foolish. Let's use this money as a down payment to give our kids what they need and keep fighting for long-term investments like fully funding Title I and IDEA. And let's expand community schools. Embed them everywhere. Community schools enable equity by connecting families to services right in the school, from homework help and after school care to medical and mental health services and housing and legal assistance. We saw just how essential community schools are when COVID hit. Services, structures, and relationships were in place from day one in community schools, and they helped lessen the fallout of the pandemic. At Fannie Lou Haber Freedom High School, which is a community school in the Bronx, the family engagement coordinator, social workers, and other staff work with community partners to address barriers to remote learning and to provide virtual services like tutoring, college coaching sessions, and mental health services. They've helped families access food and housing assistance. Many families with students 
at Harlem Park Elementary and Middle School in Baltimore, another community school. We're on the edge of crisis before the pandemic. Harlem Park utilized their family tree, a network of mental health organizations, social workers, and other experts to help families in crisis. So parents had lots of support. And a school monitor, who is also a DJ, put on a virtual dance party every week to break the grind and loneliness of learning from home. And every morning, Harlem Park staff meet on Zoom to do breathing exercises and to check in with each other. Community schools not only help meet students and families' basic needs, they have a positive effect on attendance, great advancement, graduation, and reducing disciplinary incidents. And in addition to New York City and Baltimore, AFT affiliates have worked throughout the country with their school districts to expand community schools, including Chicago, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Houston, Brooklyn Center, St. Paul, Deer River, and Duluth, Minnesota, Messina, Rome, and Saranac Lake, New York. And last month, the Los Angeles Unified Board of Education voted to increase the number of community schools in the district to 70 over the next three years. Thank you, UTLA. Many more students and families could benefit from this wraparound support, and that's why the AFT is calling for 25,000 community schools by 2025. And we are using our innovation fund this year, as we have in the past, to help seed more. There's a lot of concern about learning loss and even warnings about a lost generation because of COVID. There have been widespread disruptions to learning during remote instruction, and equity gaps have grown wider. And this is especially true for students with special needs. But this deficit mindset disregards what students have learned this year. It assumes there won't be any efforts to help students recover or that those efforts will be insufficient. And it ignores all that educators like you have done this year, working past the point of exhaustion. I'm concerned that these fears could lead some officials to double down on standardized testing. What we should be doing and doubling down on is lowering class size and providing the conditions and the tools educators need to meet the academic needs of our students. So here's an idea. Let's start by letting teachers administer curriculum link diagnostic assessments. This will help teachers customize supports to accelerate learning. We need to take a cue from the countries that outpace us, and we need to rethink our accountability systems in the United States. The purpose of large-scale standardized testing is to measure how systems are working writ large. It's not for measuring individual kids, schools, or teachers. Standardized testing doesn't help kids learn, and it doesn't help teachers teach. We need to measure what matters. So we are calling on educational sec Education Secretary Miguel Cardona to form a task force to rethink how we address both assessment and accountability. Personally, I'm a huge fan of project-based learning. Where it's done well, assessing knowledge is a seamless part of the learning process often through performance-based tasks. And I'm pretty confident teachers would do more of that if they had the authority, the tools, and the time that is currently eaten up by standardized testing. Career Tech Ed is an example of project-based instruction. 95% of students concentrating in CTE programs graduate from high school, about 10 percentage points higher than the national average. And survey data shows that CTE students are more satisfied with their education experience than students not involved in CTE. 
Students have surprised themselves by yearning to be back in school this year. Let's stoke their excitement about learning with interesting projects. Let's make sure learning feels worthwhile so that kids wake up every day eager to be in school. And our wonderful secretary treasurer, Frederick Ingram, a high school band director and a talented musician in his own right, will talk in our closing session about how music and the arts can connect students to school. As much as we want to feel normal again, we can do better than the old normal. That old normal of narrow test-based accountability systems, vast inequality, and chronic underfunding. We have a rare opportunity to reimagine public schooling in America and to pursue bold initiatives that will help all our kids thrive. And the foundation for that, the foundation for all of this, is the first of the three R's, reading. Reading is at the root of so much that we want for children. It's the key to unleash their curiosity, to dig deep into their interests, and to learn critical content like science, arts, history, and literature. And more than 20 years ago, the AFT zeroed in on the need for educators, whatever their subject or level, to know more about research-based literacy. We shared the research, we trained thousands of teachers, and a little publication called Teaching, Reading, and Rocket Science by the amazing Louisa Motes became a staple of reading programs across the country. <laughs> this weekend, I actually was cleaning up many of my papers from teaching, and I found a copy, an old copy of this pamphlet. Today, we know even more about the science of reading and how much it matters. Before the pandemic, under-resourced schools were struggling to provide high-quality reading instruction and needed academic supports. Students who have already been marginalized they have to have the academic knowledge and the skills needed for strong literacy. So we are redoubling AFT's commitment to help our members improve their instruction in literacy. Our incomparable executive vice president, Evelyn DeJesus, will lead this campaign. We'll be rolling it out over the next several months, starting with an online hub of updated resources, a series of back-to-school webinars, and a survey that will let you tell us what you need to support struggling readers, including the availability of books through our partnership with First Book. And by the way, Louisa updated her great work. We published it this year in American Educator, and there are two roundtables that teach on this. And speaking of First Book, Next month is the 10th anniversary of the AFT First Book Partnership, which began with a book distribution in Charleston, West Virginia. In the decade since, more than 500 AFT locals have been involved, and together we have distributed more than 7.3 million books to children who might otherwise not have books on their own. And Title I teachers, you can always get a discount on the First Book website. So to commemorate this 10th year anniversary, we're going to be back in Charleston, where we'll have a big book distribution event and set up care closets in three schools with personal care items, school supplies, and other necessities. And we are also providing members across the country with reimagining public education grants of $5,000 for books and other resources from First Book to support students and educators this coming year. So, as most of you know, I am a social studies teacher, a lawyer, and a believer in democracy. So allow me a point of personal privilege 
to dwell on civics before I end. Not dry didactic lessons on topics such as how a bill becomes a law, but really civics and engagement of young people in our country and in our democracy. Young people learn how to be citizens in a democracy by actually engaging in the work of citizenship examining an issue that is important in their own lives, studying what different parts of government and civil society can do to address it, and advocating for policies to make change. So we have another new program, the AFT's new Educating for Democratic Citizenship program aims to put powerful civics education tools directly into teachers' hands. We've selected 20 teacher fellows from three school districts, ABC Unified in LA County, Dearborn, Michigan, and New York City, to participate in this program. Hopefully this is only a start. These accomplished fellows will work in cohorts to produce materials for civic education centered around inquiry learning and action civics. And then those materials will go into an online library and be available through Share My Lesson. Civics content will be created by and for teachers from elementary to high school. Stay tuned. Because more than ever, young people need skills to be better consumers of information. A new study by researchers at Stanford just blew me away. It shows an alarming inability by high school students to detect fake news, suggesting a need to better prepare students for a world filled with a continued flow of disinformation. Take this example. In one of the study's tasks, students viewed an anonymously produced video that circulated on Facebook in 2016 claiming to show ballot stuffing during a Democratic primary election. Researchers asked students to use the internet to determine whether the video provided strong evidence of voter fraud. Just three, three of the study's more than 3,000 participants, less than one-tenth of one percent, were able to find the true source of the video, which actually showed footage of voter fraud in Russia. Being able to discern fact from fiction is crucial to being an informed citizen, and civic responsibility is essential right now. We're witness to widespread attacks on the right to vote and the most serious threats to our democracy in our lifetime. I've watched with alarm as these threats have proliferated and reached the highest levels of government. As some of you know, I can see the dome of the United States Capitol from the window of my office. Exactly six months ago, January 6th, I was in my office as insurrectionists stormed the Capitol with the intention of stopping the legitimate certification of the presidential election. And some having the intention of harming and even killing elected officials. The seat of our democracy was attacked by violent insurgents. Capitol Police officers were assaulted and overrun. This was not tourism, as one congressman described it. This was terrorism. The truth must not be obstructed. It must come out. That's why it was deeply disappointing that not enough Republican senators would join Democrats so that our country could establish a bipartisan, independent commission to investigate the January 6th attack. So I am asking, we are asking everyone who wants American democracy to endure. Don't thwart this process. Let's discover the truth. 
Which brings me to another attempt to suppress the truth. The new culture campaign, some lawmakers and Fox News are using to distort history, limit learning, and stoke fears about our public schools. Let's be clear. Critical race theory is not taught in elementary schools or middle schools or high schools. It's a method of examination taught in law school and in college that helps analyze whether systemic racism exists, and in particular, whether it has an effect on law and public policy. But culture warriors are labeling any discussion of race, racism, or discrimination as CRT to try to make it toxic. They are bullying teachers and trying to stop us from teaching students accurate history. This harms students. These cultural warriors want to deprive students of a robust understanding of our common history. This will put students at a disadvantage in life by knocking a big hole in their understanding of our country and the world. Yale historian Timothy Snyder likens it to the memory laws of Soviet and other repressive and authoritarian regimes. Because authoritarians take actions designed to manipulate interpretation of the past, then assert a mandatory view of events, and then forbid discussion of accurate historical facts. But you, the professionals in the classroom, just like you do the formative assessments, just like you're trying to do everything you can to engage kids, just like you've tried to keep kids safe and engaged in this last 16 months, you, the professionals in the classroom, you, the people who use your expertise to help our students succeed, you know better. We teach history, not hate. Because no matter our color, our background, or our zip code, we want our kids to have an education that imparts honesty about who we are, integrity about how we treat others, and courage to do what's right. We want to raise young people who can understand facts, study the truth, examine diverse perspectives, and draw their own conclusions. In other words, to think critically. Teaching America's history requires considering all the facts available to us, including those that are uncomfortable, like the history of enslavement and discrimination towards people of color and people perceived as different. Years ago, our country unified against Holocaust deniers. We must unite again to address racism and its long-term effects. And by the way, Students, at least older students who were recently polled, agreed. 82% of college students overall say public schools should teach that patterns of racism are ingrained in law and other institutions. And that included half of college Republicans. These laws restricting what we teach impinge on educators' professional obligations, our obligation to teach honest history, as well as to teach current events, like the January 6th attack on the Capitol, and to teach in accordance with the standards that each state adopts, which of course is a requirement for teacher licensure. It's so ironic that many of the same lawmakers who are so hell-bent on assessments based on state standards are now passing contradictory legislation that forbids teachers from teaching some of these standards. A new Texas law, for example, states that teachers may not teach the concept that slavery and racism are anything other than deviations from betrayals of or failures to live up to the authentic founding principles of the United States. 
how do we then teach the Civil War, the Dred Scott decision, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th, 14th, or 15th Amendments, or Juneteenth? Mark my words, our union will defend any member who gets in trouble for teaching honest history. We have a legal defense fund ready to go, and we are preparing for litigation as we speak. Teaching the truth is not radical or wrong. Distorting history and threatening educators for teaching the truth is what is truly radical and wrong. Today, tragically, the United States is dangerously divided. But our divides are not unbridgeable. People can disagree and still see each other's humanity. We all lose when we demonize and otherize our neighbors. We win when we put hope over fear, when we seek the well-being not just of ourselves and the people we love, but of everyone in this country that we love. Remember, the Pledge of Allegiance, it ends with liberty and justice for all. So when your students walk through the door of your classroom this fall, or into your building, or into your bus. They will bring with them the scars of a long struggle we wish they hadn't had to endure. You'll help them recover and to feel safe and welcome. Your students will also bring with them their dreams and their aspirations and their potential. And you'll get back to what brought you to our hope-filled profession in the first place. To teach the future caretakers of our, to teach the future caretakers of our environment, the sparks who ignite our innovations, the tenders of our global relationships, the healers of our sick, the creators of our arts and the teachers who will follow us. You, you are your student's lifeline. You make it possible to connect what they know and what they can do. The past 16 months have been incredibly difficult. I hope you know that what you have done and what you will do are vitally important are essential, are critical. We're in this together. Colleague to colleague, AFT member to AFT member, together we can do so much that would be impossible on our own. So thank you. And I hope you enjoy the incredibly rich offerings of this year's Teach.